Okay, good morning. This is Richard Shu, host of Shu Untied. Today, I'm very happy to have as my guest, Ulysses Huey, who's a partner at Davis Wright & Tremaine. Ulysses, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Richard. So you definitely have one of the more interesting backgrounds uh, I have come across. Let me start by asking you why you went to law school in the first place. Well, um, coming out of high school, I was I had a strong math and science background. Hmm. Um, and then I went to college and had to choose a major. And my dad advised me to not take any Mickey Mouse courses. I was never sure what he meant, but I think, um, you know, not the humanities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I rebelled and majored in philosophy. And what led me there was in my senior year in high school, I had, you know, I could take an elective in the spring and you're basically on your way to, you know, just college at that point. And I took philosophy on a whim and I didn't understand anything the teacher was saying. <laughs> and I got probably the worst grade I've ever gotten. And so as a considering majors, that stuck with me. I mean, not to just jump into philosophy, but it was like, I have to be able to figure a little bit out about philosophy. I mean, you know, I'm an average intelligence and there's lots of, you know, people in the field and I've got to be able to do it. So I started taking philosophy courses starting all the way from the uh, in the Western tradition from the pre-Socratics uh, to Socrates and Plato. And I got hooked. So hmm. Hmm. that became my major and I um, graduated with that. And then I was working in New York City uh, afterwards. Um, and I met a, uh, I thought about going to graduate school in philosophy and I met hmm. another um, um, philosophy a PhD candidate. And he told me about the jobs you could get afterwards and how much you would make. And I thought, okay, I, I can't do that. <laughs> There's no way. So, you know, I wound my way through a, you know, a couple jobs in New York City from a bookstore to, um, interestingly enough, KKR, a, a leveraged buyout company. Hmm. And then I landed an entry-level position at an investment bank, a small investment bank. Hmm. And I was a securities analyst, so doing technical and fundamental analysis. And most of our, we did micro and small cap IPOs. And most of the clients that we took public were very innovative tech companies. Hmm. So for example, a Israeli company that had an internet telephony product. Uh, and it was a keyboard with a phone you'd stuck it, stick on it, you know, uh, in a modem. And it was way ahead of its time. So I don't know what happened to it. Um, but that was very interesting to me. Hmm. And my roommate at the time, briefly, was um, dead set on going to law school. So he said, I had not considered it, but he said, could you please take uh, the LSAT prep course with me? Because otherwise I will not be able to study if you, my roommate, are just, you know, out um, and about in New York <laughs> City. So I thought about it and I kind of thought, why not? I'd been in the securities for a little while and I thought I'd just try it. So hmm. I did. And then um, I got a better LSAT score than he did. <laughs> and he's fine. He's uh, uh, He went to UChicago okay. and... Um, He's uh, an attorney general now, so he's doing quite well. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got into Stanford, I knew I was going there um, really? because I had this vision of the West Coast. Um, it didn't completely match my vision, but I'm very, very glad I came out. Yeah, right. Well, how did you like law school? Was it, I mean, you know, it was something you fell in love with right away? I mean, you obviously weren't thinking about it for a lot, long time. You didn't grow up in a family of lawyers. What did you think when you got there? You know, what drove, um, what kind of piqued my interest the most was, and my motivation was, you know, after working, I enjoyed college. And after working for a while, I felt like going back to school. Hmm. And there's this pattern. So then I go to school and then I want to go back to work. <laughs> um, so I like the kind of academic or intellectual rigor. 
I like the steep learning curve to, mm. you know, really learning something new and different. Mm. Um, and so it just was a, you know, really stimulating time mm. for mm. me. Mm. Now, how did you, it looks like you, after law school, you actually became a litigator. How, tell me a little bit how that came about. Yeah, so my my dad was an investment banker and I started briefly in banking. I always assumed I would just go into uh, corporate law because, right. you know, I knew corp some corporate lawyers. Right. Um, but it turned out my favorite class was civil procedure. And uh, my favorite teacher, uh, the late Professor Barbara Babcock, who taught it. And so that kind of propelled me. I, then I thought, you know, if I'm going to go into the law and private practice, you know, I, I'm going to try litigation. Hmm, interesting. And how did that, and how did you like litigation? Um, I liked it. It's, it really um, was, a, was a great fit. I had, when I got out of law school, I did a nonprofit for a little bit, but I knew I, you know, wanted to practice law. Yeah. And so I joined a litigation boutique, um, which was very gung ho about trial, being a trial lawyer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was very interesting. We did a broad swath of litigation, uh, general litigation at the time, commercial general. Um, but then I uh, started to build a patent litigation practice. Yeah. And I got hooked into that. I had not taken an IP law course in school because I had just never thought about it, mm -hmm. never occurred to me. But when I dived into the opportunity to learn technology and this crazy patent regime, it um, it kind of just uh, grabbed me and I hmm. I loved it. And then I was an IP litigator, a patent litigator for a long time. Hmm. Well, then tell me, how did you, and so then you went in house, it looks like, and tell me some, tell me what, what, how did that happen? So I was, um, you know, enjoying patent litigation, enjoying being at a firm, um, mentoring associates and all that stuff. Yeah. And then, but long term, I thought, you know, um, I love the stand up, but maybe I'd get to do, with those giant patent cases that we were doing. Yeah. And I think it's different now, but, you know, I'd maybe be in court and have a role maybe twice a year if I was lucky. Mm. So I thought, eh, you know, that's not enough. And then, you know, I got an opportunity. A, a client called me up and told me to shoot around a, a job uh, opening. And it was to be the first GC of uh, the combination of three Japanese um display companies hmm. so that they could combine forces and better compete, have more capacity, have the technology and patent portfolio to compete, um, you know, with, you know, the kind of the globalization of the display business as well as other tech. And so it piqued my curiosity and I was about to send it out to everyone in my firm, you know, and then I decided, well, maybe I won't do that and I'll just call my friend up. Interesting. And I got to learn more about the job. They did a, you know, uh, nationwide search, but I, you know, had an in and I hit it off with the uh, person who was hiring. And so, you know, I just jumped into it. I had already, my practice had gotten into strategic IP transactions and counseling oh, by, and cool. some tech trans by that time. Um, so give me a little bit of a more breadth of a background. Mm -hmm. um, and negotiation was my second favorite class. So I found out that's pretty much at least what I did every day, mm. I'd say, when I was in-house. Mm. And so then you also got exposure to corporate and that sort of thing as well? Yeah, so it was very interesting um, combination. Uh, spun out, went private, went public again in uh, Tokyo on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Oh, wow. And it needed all legal infrastructure, policies, procedures, compliance. So I did a lot of that first. Hmm. And then as it was growing and working with, um, you know, mentoring and working with lawyers and at this company, IP was completely separate from the legal department. So kind of building a lot of bridges with IP uh, probably helped that I had a background. Mm -hmm. 
for growing, I got tabbed to be in more kind of strategic uh, deals and strategic transactions hmm. as we partnered with uh, new big customers and um, other players kind of in the industry or the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Did you miss being a litigator? Well, the part I missed, funnily enough, I, I kind of missed writing. <laughs> you know, I, I enjoyed writing, um, you know, summary judgment briefs and yeah. uh, digging into the digging into things and, and trying to just show, you know, um, why uh, we should win. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that that takes a, a lot of detail, a lot of time. Uh, and then I missed the stand up, but I wasn't going to get a ton of that anyway. Hmm. And I really enjoyed the negotiation and getting into it, learning the intricacies of, you know, what you do as a GC and getting called in for the biggest strategic deal. So my favorite part was working with management hmm. Um, hmm. and, you know, helping them navigate and negotiate um, the legal issues that they're less familiar with. Hmm. Interesting. And it wasn't a problem that you didn't speak Japanese? No. So I'm Chinese, as you know, and in a way, they all spoke English pretty well yeah. and probably wrote in English better. Um, so that was an, an issue. And in a way, it kind of shielded me because uh, since I didn't speak Japanese and I wasn't Japanese, I wasn't subject to the same cultural mm -hmm. expectations mm -hmm. in the Japanese corporate culture. So they mm -hmm. could be they could excuse me as like, oh, he's, you know, he's, not he's a rogue wild card. Uh, <laughs> so, it, you know, allowed me to a little bit more forward and and direct with them. Interesting. So now you end up obviously end up going back to private practice. How did that happen? And why not go on to be another GC? I mean, it sounds like you had a great run as a general counsel. It sounds like you enjoyed it. Why not another in-house position? Why back to private practice? So you're right. I really did enjoy being a GC, a general counsel. And I thought that... You know, I'd been there uh, for a while, and interestingly enough, I'd seen the kind of entire kind of product and life cycle. Um, so like a lot of startups don't value, oh, I've seen when you reorg and EOL and, you know, your volumes declining or just flat because they're just interested in the, uh, you know, uh, right side of the hockey stick. Um, but I thought it'd be fun to join a company at an earlier stage and at a growth stage. Um, hyper growth was kind of my, the most exciting part of being at, at my company. And so as I began looking around, um, a friend recommended a recruiter. So, you know, I, I talked to them and a number of them and she was great. And every now and then, as I looked, she'd bring you know, the timing was per perhaps not perfect as we were hitting the pandemic. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had been inter talking, interviewing and meeting folks for a while. And then when she she bring me law firm offers every now and then mm -hmm. or, you know, law firm um, interest. And at first I was like, no, uh, you know, I'm not I don't want to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, but as they kept coming, I, you know, I got the notion in my head that, OK, well, I always liked, enjoyed being at a law firm. Um, I enjoyed, you know, I really liked the challenge of developing business, mm -hmm. which I was able to do relatively well before I went in-house. Mm -hmm. And I thought during my in-house tenure, especially in the Bay Area, I got to meet all these great other legal leaders mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in-house and, uh, and outside counsel, um, especially through the Bay Area Asian American General Counsel Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. group. So I thought it would be great to work with multiple clients again mm -hmm. and to, you know, get to learn their businesses as I learn, um, you know, the ins and outs of my company's business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I began to look at firms and, you know, I knew I didn't want to kind of necessarily go back to a big firm. Mm -hmm. Um, or there might be sharp elbows, you know, about equity or or whatever. And so I met with DWT or Davis Wright Tremaine, 
And their culture just really appealed to me and and kind of the role they were looking for. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they did a great job in interviews because every single person I met was, you know, just really nice, um, you know, kind of more laid back, but, um, you know, really into their practice. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to grow Silicon Valley practice because they had mm -hmm. built up a tech practice with some companies here that was going very well. Um, but its offices at the time were in California, were in LA and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, that's a very big challenge. You know, during my time, I've seen many, many law firms try to, uh, out-of-state law firms try to plant a flagpole in Silicon Valley, pouring millions of dollars in, and usually eventually <laughs> petering out. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I was like, I've been in the Valley my whole time. I, you know, I'm well networked here and I, you know, kind of get it and enjoy doing that. So I went in and I went into tech trans as opposed to IP litigation. Mm -hmm. So I could get that kind of um, exposure to the, to the kind of business side. Mm -hmm. As an IP litigator or patent lawyer, you're kind of a, a paid sniper mm -hmm. like uh, to mm -hmm. do a particular issue and the part of that i enjoyed most was diving into the technology with the engineers mm -hmm. and the business model with um product and accounting mm -hmm. so you know when you are a securities analyst you need to learn your accounting mm -hmm. um, so i had that kind of background and it's turned out to be great the other thing i wanted i'll just mention is to learn to learn again to mm -hmm. um so they have a very diversified practice. And I was in um, hardware space. This gave me an opportunity to get into, you know, other areas where I could learn and expand my experience. And since I've gotten here, it's only, it's been a year and nine months, uh, just about. You know, I've gotten to do work for quantum computing clients, non-fungible token clients, um, even satellite, space satellite clients. Hmm. Um, so it's just been, I really enjoy that hmm. to be able to, you know, get more tech in my uh, kind of wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. Well, Ulysses, you've obviously done a lot of super interesting things, but the one thing that really stood out on your resume to me was that you were a sous chef for a few months. Tell me a little about what that was all about and how did that happen? Yeah, so I've always liked to eat um, and you know, my, my family is all about food. We plan a vacation. <laughs> it's about food. Um, <laughs> and so, and my dad cooked and my mom cooked a little and uh, I thought, you know, I'll give this a go. I want to be able to cook the food I like to eat. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I got the chance. There was this Northern Italian restaurant in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where we would go. Um, when, you know, when we were out there and I just asked the chef one day if, you know, I could, um, you know, do a summer there mm -hmm. as an extern or apprentice. And she said, um, okay, well, you know, can you write me a letter of why you want to do it? Usually I take, cause summer is a very busy season. I take externs from the CIA or Culinary Institute of America. And, you know, I have to reteach them everything anyway. So she took a flyer on me and I, she said, just show up with, uh, you know, a chef's knife, a filleting knife and um, paring knife. And you're, you know, we'll, we'll teach you everything else. Hmm. And so I learned so much that's that summer hmm. um, as a, you know, from butchering rabbits, chickens, to making bread, to making fresh pasta. Um, and, you know, I love creating the dishes because that I would think these are really gonna be delicious <laughs> and, and putting them out there. So it was, a, it was a great restaurant. We only served dinner. Hmm. So I had kind of mornings free. I could go fly fishing or mountain biking. Hmm. And then I'd come in early and, you know, we'd write the menu um, when we got in on a little chalkboard. And I, so I'd prep for that and then uh, cook the, you know, staff meal. 
and then go to work. And it was all about production in the U.S. Uh, and because you have small kitchens, you don't have a ton of staff typically, and sometimes you do, you know, on a busy night, hundred covers, which mm. means you know, uh, customers, mm. and. You know, I really love that and seriously considered becoming a uh, professional chef. Hmm. She gave me the opportunity as I got into it to kind of create things and create dishes. And she was expecting. So for a while, she just let me run the restaurant oh, wow. um, as a chef by myself. Hmm. And so I had seriously considered that. Hmm. Hmm. Any future thoughts that you might go do that again one of these days? Yeah, perhaps uh, in a slightly different role. The reason why I, kind of the reason why I didn't do it was um, the pressure. So I understand the pressure chefs feel because every single dish ha you make has to be perfect or just to the, to the best of your ability. Right. Um, you know, and at a very high standard because otherwise customer gets it that's all they you know the diner uh eats that and that's all they know about you and they think ah eh, you know that wasn't that great so i was like that is uh it's a hard thing to do i really uh, respect you know um chefs line chefs you know there's a lot of burnout they you know try at your favorite restaurant you know the you know, the chefs have turned over already a number of times. Mm. Um, someone who can be consistent over years is very impressive. Someone like, um, or a restaurant like Le Bernardin, which is just as good now as it was, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Right, right, right. Well, Ulysses, it's been a really interesting conversation. I really appreciate your taking the time. <clears throat> if you do decide to open up a restaurant, please come back and tell me about it. Okay, I will. I'll definitely do that. It'll probably be uh, in a decade or so, but. <laughs> okay. This is Richard Shue and Ulysses Huey. Thanks.